So welcome everybody. It looks like we are ready to get started. Um, Matt, are you ready to get started? I sure am, and I, I do apologize, everyone. A half hour before it was supposed to start, the uh, computer told me it needed to do a critical update and Zoom needed to be reloaded, so. Well, that is uh, quite all right, because we had a little chat um, while you were gone talking about uh, Brill liners most recently. Um, so it looks like um, we are gonna get started now. I already introduced the museum, and uh, this is the man we've been waiting for here. <laughs> oh boy, I was a young man then. <laughs> I really love this photo. Um, this, uh, this, is, this is Matt Non, one of our presenters tonight. He's a licensed professional engineer who works full time in the transit industry. He's led, supported, and consulted on a number of PCC car projects for multiple museums, as well as the transit industry. He's a co-founder and director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, as well as a trustee of the National Capital Trolley Museum and the director of development for Baltimore Streetcar Museum. So he's one of our presenters tonight. And our other presenter is Harry Donahue, who's been on here uh, answering questions. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, Harry's a retired professional educator and former bus driver and dispatcher. And he's been involved with trolley museums for a number of years and led the initial restoration of former SEPTA PCC car 2168 at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. Harry is also a co-founder and director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. And without further ado, uh, Matt, if you are ready to share your screen, go ahead and do that. Everybody else, I'm going to ask you to mute yourselves or come around and mute. And we are going to turn off our videos now as well. So um, please joining me, join me in welcoming Matt and Harry. All right. It's just going into slideshow mode here. Chris, I trust uh, everybody can see the screen? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So again, I uh, appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, appreciate Harry uh, filling in for a while. And uh, while we solve some unanticipated issues, I'd, I'd rather fix a PCC than a computer. Let's just put it that way. But um, I really want to thank too, Kristen, for uh, letting us put this together and really doing the graphic that we had here to get started with. Uh, Kristen, I don't know how you did that, but this really, you know, to show the uh, the car of many colors in many colors is quite an accomplishment. Um, but our presentation tonight, we're going to tell the story of car 2168. And I have to say, this is, um, as Harry may have told you in some of the opening comments, you know, we just had a lot of fun putting this together. Harry and I have a long affiliation with this car. Um, and it's more than just, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. It's more than just a couple of enthusiasts saying, hey, here's our favorite car. Here's why we like it. Um, th this car is a great story to tell. And that's what we're here for. We're going to talk about its service life in Philadelphia, um, how it ended up surviving and why it was such an unlikely candidate, uh, how it was restored and brought back to life, the impact it's made both at its host museum, Baltimore, as well as, you know, across a lot of museums. 2168 led to a lot of good things. Uh, it's educational value. It's not just, you know, a car for the enthusiasts, but how this has helped tell a story, an underrepresented story and sustainment, you know, what uh, has been going on to ensure this car was not just saved and restored, but maintained as a operating exhibit. So let's start with the service life of the car in Philadelphia. A new car, car 2168, as here on the, shown here on the screen, was part of the last order of new street cars for Philadelphia in 32 years, uh, car 2168, was ordered in 1946. Uh, it was originally, at least based on some notes, Harry and I still need to do some verification, but it's believed it was originally to be a two-man car, motorman and a conductor. Uh, but during construction or just prior to construction, that configuration was changed to uh, just use a sole operator. The car started to be delivered via flat car to Philadelphia starting in the end of May, 1948. And as mentioned, these were the last new cars for Philadelphia in well over 30 years. This is an early shot. Unfortunately, we'll talk about later, we don't have a as delivered shot of 2168, but this is sister car 2145 uh, seen here where the cars are delivered in Parkside, at Parkside in West Philadelphia uh, via connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad. This shot was taken by Harry and I's good friend, the late Ernie Moser, who was also a uh, 
an operator for a number of years in Philadelphia. And this is one of Ernie's original negatives that Harry has scanned and had cleaned up. So what do we know about 2160s early, ser early service life? Thankfully, uh, we acquired a set of maintenance records for the car uh, dating back to when it entered service into the early 70s. After that time, at least keeping up this, this large index card, if you want to say, that kept the records stopped. But we know that the car entered revenue service for the first time on July 5th, 1948. And as the cars were delivered, it was one of the cars that was equipped with General Electric equipment. Um, they were first assigned to Luzerne Depot. And we don't know for sure what route it, the car originally served on. They were first assigned to Routes 56 and Route 6, um, but that was only temporary. As the car was then moved to Luzerne Depot, uh, or from Luzerne to Frankfurt at the, in Northeast Philadelphia, in, by September of 1948, September 2nd. And the plan was to replace old or two-man cars primarily on Route 5, and then as well for Sunday service on routes three and actually route 15, which was split between two depots, Frankfurt and Callow Hill. Harry, do you want to tell a little more about why the car was assigned to route five? Well, according to the late Ernie Moser and Tony Sassa, another late operator, uh, route five was a very heavy line from Frankfurt all the way to South Philly, but it certainly was a congested line. It ran under the L with 25 mile an hour near sides on Route 3. And then it wound its way through Kensington and all kinds of factory streets around Frankfurt Avenue. So, and then one way streets, second and third, all the way to South Philly. So it, they, they assigned 48 cars to that line and the line did not take advantage of the PCC speed and, 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 and acceleration because they couldn't, they couldn't go very fast. Uh, Ernie and Tony Sassa told me years ago, they had heard, they were operators at the time, they had heard that it was a way to get rid of the two man, the conductors on Route 5, because it was a two man, had been a two man line for many, many years. And basically they said, well, we'll give you brand new streamliners, but we're getting rid of the conductors. Because uh, there were other lines that would have benefited from PCCs, like Lehigh Avenue or, or Girard Avenue, 15. But yeah, so Route 5 certainly did not take advantage of, of the uh, high-speed PCCs. But that's where its first eight years, that's where it's been at. Thanks, Harry. So in our next slide, this computer wants to move forward. Is here at Frankfurt Depot. We don't know for sure if car 2168 is one of the cars pictured, uh, but you can see here it was right around the time the cars were delivered. They still had the gray roof, the pinstriping, the red pinstriping around the standee windows. Uh, it's really a neat shot of Frankfurt Depot. You could see some of the older equipment still in use, the near sides, there's some double-ended cars, a utility car. But pretty much this is uh, what it would have looked like when the car was new uh, for its operating base. And this shot, uh, Harry and I got courtesy of Ed Springer, it was a scanned slide. It's 2198, but this gives you an idea of two things. One, how 2168 originally looked, and two, a little bit about Route 5. It, it ran through... You know, a dense urban area, as Harry mentioned, under the elevated in Frankfurt, and then on narrow second and third streets through Center City all the way to South Philly, to Rittner, way at the bottom of South Philly. But you can see here, you know, what the cars looked like. Uh, Quaker Sugar was advertised for a number of years on the cars. But then starting around 1951, uh, PTC shops started eliminating the gray roof and the pinstriping. And as Harry mentioned, as we were putting this together, you know, it's fair to say this is the way when people think of a Philadelphia street car, you know, in the PTC era, the green and cream, this is how a lot of people remember them. Yeah, the, the gray roofs were gone very quickly. The first paint job, it was just too much trouble because they had to get these cars painted fast and back out on the street. And they didn't have time to do the pinstriping and, and so forth. So this is how most people remember them. 
You see here another shot uh, Harry and I got from the courtesy of Ed Springer. And all the photos in here, you know, Harry and I have carefully checked. They're all from Harry's collection, my own. We, we've tried to make sure everything here is legitimate use. That way we could record this. So, uh, you know, hopefully nothing escaped by. But this gives you an idea again, as Harry said, that the way most people remembered the cars in PTC era, here towards the end of rail service on Route 5. So as Harry alluded to, some changes were coming. In 1955, PTC took delivery of secondhand PCC cars from Kansas City. And originally, they were assigned to, uh, to Frankfurt. And it that led to the transfer of 2168 and its sister cars to Luzerne Depot. Um, Frankfurt Depot itself was on the way to being reconstructed for use by rubber tired vehicles only, buses and trackless trolleys. And 2168 then pretty much led a life you know, of obscurity. Uh, it operated out of the Luzerne Depot on the routes operating from there. I've listed them uh, frequently seen on Route 47 for many years. And this next photo shows it on Route 6 in 1958. And you can see it shows a little bit of, you know, service life in Philadelphia. Cars starting to rust a little bit. There's a couple of dents. You know, still looks good, but as we'll talk about a little bit later, but it still has its Quaker sugar signs. They, they <laughs> were on un, until the SEPTA era. PTC used them a lot, those Quaker sugar ads. <laughs> so, and oddly enough, this is the earliest photo Harry and I have found of the car in service. As we said, it, it was really obscure in its early service life. Um, just, you know, another car, the average car, if you want to say. This is shot on Route 47. As I mentioned, it's been a number of years on this long north-south route. Um, it shows a little bit of the density in Center City. It's here on Chestnut, it's crossing Chestnut Street or just cross Chestnut Street. You can see the crowds back then downtown, a little bit of traffic. Uh, again, you know, the car bears the scars of heavy use in an urban area. The car also ran on Route 50. Many people knew 50 because it uh, passed by Independence Mall. Um, you can see here again, you know, well-maintained car with some wear and tear. Uh, this photo and the next one were courtesy of a friend of Harry's, uh, Jim Gallhofer, who really took some great shots back in the 60s. Uh, really nicely well-composed photos of the cars. Here seen on Route 60, again operating out of Luzerne, um, shortly before the PTC was taken over by SEPTA. So I'm going to let Harry explain this one. Car 2168 is seen here on Route 23, which didn't happen very often. Harry, why don't you tell us right. why? 1962, uh, Route 23 was the realm of the 2700s. Nothing else ran there except the 2700s on Route 53. However, summer of 1962, there was some major sewer work on the upper section of Germantown Avenue. So they had to move some cars to Luzerne. And instead of moving all the 2700s to Luzerne for the 23, they moved half of them. And then they filled in with 2100s, uh, which was very unusual to see a 2100 on the 23. So for about two or three months in the summer of 1962, the 2100s were mixed in on Route 23. And Matt, you found this shop, this shot on eBay or something? Um, I sure did. I knew the seller and uh, he just happened to have a shot of 2168 and just dumb luck. And that's when Harry said, hey, wait a minute. You don't understand how unique yeah, it he's, is. He's a pullout uh, coming down York Road to Erie, cross at Erie, and then he'll go down York Road and get right on Germantown Avenue. But that was just that one summer. So definitely, you know, if you want to say the rarest photo we've ever found of the car by for sure. So by 1968, the car had a new owner, but also a new assignment. Uh, SEPTA, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, took over from PTC in September of 1968. That summer, shortly before the takeover, PTC transferred six of the all-electric cars, including number 2168, to Woodland Depot for service on the subway surface routes. For people not familiar with Philadelphia's uh, trolley system, the routes, the subway surface routes in West Philadelphia run underground, uh, primarily through Center City, at the edge of what's called University City and then Center City. What was interesting about this was 
P PCC cars were assigned to the subway in 1955, but PTC's engineering department felt that the lack of brake shoes on the all electric cars would give problems with the signals. It was felt that the because there was no brake shoes, like there were on the air brake equipped cars, the wheels wouldn't be shiny enough to shunt or to trip the signals. That tended, that later found to be not factual, concerning, but not factual. And shortly before the SEPTA takeover, the first six cars of the, the all electric cars came to West Philadelphia. Thus, right. the newest and cars in the fleet came over. Go ahead, Harry. Oh, I was going to say the reason they had to do this transfer is there was going to be major repairs on the Girard Avenue Bridge, which would cut off the Cortland shops for major repairs. So they wanted to get the newer all electrics over to the subway in West Philly and move the old, older air cars back up to North Philly because they wouldn't have access to the Girard Avenue Bridge for a couple of years. So they had this big transfer in late 68 and brought a whole bunch of all electrics down. And 2168 was in the first group. Thankfully, our, our good friend and co-founder, Friends Filled Up for Trolleys, Dave Harwitz, took this shot of 2168 uh, right after it came to West Philadelphia. It was a bit of a novelty to see an all-electric car in West Philadelphia at that time, or at least on the subway surface routes of West Philadelphia. And you'd see here it's passing the former Woodland Depot. So then the car became famous, at least briefly. Cars 2168 and air-equipped car 2565 were unveiled in March of 1973 as SEPTA's, quote, painted ladies. They even put together a brochure about them. Um, Thankfully, it wasn't just a paint job. The cars were completely overhauled, electrically and mechanically. SEPTA put together a pamphlet about the work. They even said the car was rewired, which helped ensure its longevity. Um, SEPTA called the colors gold, or was really yellow, differentiating it from some older gold cars, plum or purple and white, whereas 2565 was painted in a color scheme of orange, blue, and white. It was quickly nicknamed Gulf Oil because it looked like the colors from a Gulf Oil gas station. Um, in a nod to current fashions, the interior of 2168 got wood paneling. Uh, they removed the armrest, they put wood paneling. They used new Lexan windows, new upholstery. The interior color was like a salmon. We'll have a photo of that in a moment. Um, polyurethane paint was new at that time. We scored a SEPTA. That was a big advertisement for it. Uh, and the car went back to Luzerne Depot, but only for a few weeks. Here it is at Luzerne Depot, pretty much upon completion. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was fresh out of the shop. And this Matt, is, Matt, yeah, just go, go back to that previous one, if you would. When when we restored the car, and when we got the car to Baltimore, and we start, the guy started sanding down the paint to get to the bare metal, we found evidence that evidently the whole car was painted yellow because we found the yellow up on the roof, on the sides. Uh, now, whether, whether they had planned to do an entire yellow car and then said, whoa, that's too much, we don't know. But the whole car was done in yellow. Yeah, thanks for the reminder of that, Harry. That yeah. was an interesting discovery for sure when we worked on the car. This was an interior shot. You could see the salmon color. You can't really see the wood paneling there. It's alongside the seats uh, below the windows, but you can see the pink interior. The car only lasted at Luzerne a couple of weeks, and it was back in West Philly. Uh, again, our friend Dave Harwitz captured this shot on the subway surface diversion route near University of Pennsylvania. Um, again, the car took a beating. You can see it's already starting to rust in a few places. Ed Springer captured this shot again after it was back in West Philly. Again, it's not an easy service life. The banana car, as it was nicknamed, already had a dent and was already missing a windshield wiper. Uh, yeah. Except they had a tough time at this, in this era, keeping the cars maintained. And this was a fan trip. Uh, this is a postcard, as many of you may know, of the two, quote, painted ladies together at 42nd and Chester in West Philadelphia. Um, the orange color scheme was the last. The yellow was a one and done. Yeah, and they were supposed to vote on it, and the Gulf Oil evidently won the vote. And here we are, 1974, uh, the late Richard Weibel uh, took this shot for us. You know, it shows the car in, in then fresh Gulf Oil paint. 
Uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, this is the last time the car got a full repaint in 12 years. Yeah, Matt, can I jump in here? Please, Harry. Yeah, it, it was the eight or nine months that it was the banana car. That's when the car became the most popular charter car in the city. For that eight to 10 month period that it was yellow, everybody realized it's not going to be yellow very long, so let's charter it. And I was living in North Jersey at the time, but I later found out uh, from Ernie and some of the other guys that it was out on charters constantly. And that's when it became the most popular charter car in the city, that time that it was the banana car. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, and that's if you, if you notice and you search around for photos of older Philadelphia cars, there are seemingly you know, numerous shots of the car in yellow. And as Harry mentioned, that's because it was extraordinarily popular for fan trips. In fact, as Harry mentioned, some of the operators said practically every weekend. So in 1974, it was repainted orange, uh, and that's the way it stayed for a while. This is on Route 34, about 1979. Uh, Mike Zalagi, who's done a lot of the graphics and artwork for Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, uh, by dumb luck, captured this shot uh, just outside the Woodland Portal. This is a photo of 2168 not having a good day. You can see it split the switch at um, Woodland Avenue and Island Road. Um, SEPTA did send a truck out. Harry has a series of slides of it to actually, they had to get the truck out to get it back on the rail. Uh, you can see the six has fallen off. Again, the cars, the cars had a pretty rough life in the 1970s. <coughs> this is a unique shot. Dave Harwitz captured this. This was after the blizzard of February 1978, where, you know, it's an ordinary scene in the subway, except that snow had drifted down from the streets inside the subway. This is two floors down. <laughs> uh, I was teaching school in New Jersey at the time, and we were closed for a week after that blizzard. And you can see all the people on the L platform at 30th Street. Uh, and just by luck, uh, Dave captured the car coming through the snow-covered subway two floors down. So definitely unique occurrence have snow in the subway. As I mentioned, Philadelphia is a tough place for a streetcar. Ed Springer captured this shot around 1980. Uh, they're doing work uh, right around 49th and Grace Ferry. Um, you can see the condition of the track, at least they're renewing it. Um, if you look closely, you can see the joint and how far uh, out of alignment the track is. You can see 2168 had really started to take a beating at this point. Uh, Dave Harwitz told Harry and I, he, he lived in West Philadelphia, he still does, rode the cars regularly. Um, pretty much the joke with 2168 was you just couldn't kill it. Um, but you can see the rust, the dents, the dings. The doors are now painted all orange. Uh, that would change a couple times, although the doors, <laughs> the doors lasted until we replaced them this past fall, oddly enough. They were about 50 years old. This is a shot in 1982, right before uh, the Kawasaki cars took over all service in West Philadelphia. Um, sort of an ironic shot, the car's parked outside Mount Moriah Cemetery. Um, and you can see at this point, it's, it's covered with graffiti in multiple places. It's beat up, um, but it was still a popular charter car. I have some more shots of Harry's in the, the mid 80s. And, and from banana car days, 2168 started to and remained popular. Uh, but you see by 1982, uh, you know, it, it looked like a trip to the cemetery for the car itself would, would not be far off. But it was sent back to North Philadelphia, to Luzerne. Um, this was, Ed Springer captured this shot only a few months after the previous shot. Uh, you can see here up at Mermaid Lane, but, uh, you know, they've done a little bit of work getting rid of the graffiti. They've painted the doors, but the car still is uh, in need of some major attention. And by 1986, it was really looking rough. Um, the late Frank Miklos captured this shot uh, on a Route 6 car. But yet, back in that era, this is, uh, they chartered cars for the last day of Route 53 and the last day of the six, uh, two or three cars, and every one of those last day charters, 2168, was on the charter. It's a very popular charter car. Exactly. And it was the last city car in orange. I think that also helped its popularity. It had a reputation for the operators being a very reliable car, but uh, despite its appearance, 
but it was the last uh, car in orange. The last, yeah, the last revenue car in orange. But as we mentioned, it was really an unlikely candidate for survival. But it was saved from scrap almost at the last instant. Uh, after the last day fan trip on Route 6, um, Harry learned that the car was slated to be scrapped. It was on the scrap list. And it yeah, was they, not put it on, on they put the, it on the dead, dead track after that charter. And it, everybody thought this was it. The car's gone. And it wasn't originally in the GOH, the General Overhaul Program, that rebuilt a number of the cars for further service. Uh, it was one of the last ones actually rebuilt yeah. in 1986. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the General Overhaul Program. Harry and I talked a little bit about it in one of our previous presentations on PCC car restorations. Um, they really built almost a like new car. Uh, the, the car bodies were completely stripped down. All of the running gear was completely overhauled. They were rewired. There were some variants with some cars. Some cars got a little more work than others. But by and large, they were. it really was an effective program. I, personally, some of the, the minor control modifications and the rewiring from an engineering perspective really were some smart things. I know some of the rail fans didn't like the change in the windows. Some didn't like the colors, et cetera. But in terms of reliability and the work done, we really do have to give SEPTA credit for for what they did, they made right, it right, Matt. One of the one of the things, if I could jump in here, any museum that's got a SEPTA GOH car can appreciate the good job in the rewiring underneath Absolutely. those cars are because they didn't have a lot of wear and tear on them when they got retired. And any of the museums that have them realize what a good job SEPTA did on the rewiring. Absolutely. And the car, after its rebuild in Woodland and some brief testing in West Philadelphia, went back to Luzerne Depot. This is a sister car. This is not 2168, but it gives you an extent of the rebuilding. You can see all the windows were out. Again, it was stripped underneath. Everything was rewired. Every piece of uh, running gear was overhauled. Like I said, there were some really nice changes. I won't go too far into the engineering of it, but things like a solid state voltage regulator uh, and among other things that really there were some really intelligent and effective improvements made to these cars. So here it is. A few months after it was rebuilt, Harry captured it at Bigler and Marvine in South Philadelphia. Uh, oddly enough, it didn't stay in red, white, and blue very long. Because in 1992, it was selected as one of three cars to be used in a weekend-only Chestnut Hill trolley service. There are a lot of photos of it on the Chestnut Hill trolley. I like this one because it shows it in progress. Ed Springer captured this when it was at Woodland Depot. Um, the paint wasn't that old, but it was uh, sanded down. Car was repainted. A, it was actually a cream color that quickly faded to white, as well as a green. It would later get the Chestnut Hill trolley decals. Um, this was twofold. One of the reasons was um, to maintain, there was political influence to run the trolleys in Chestnut Hill after the 23 stop through 23. And also, the cars were funded with an UMTA, now FTA, grant for service life extension. And part of the requirements of that, the FTA funding, was the cars had to have an eight-year service life. The last cars in the program didn't quite have that when the three remaining surface lines in Philadelphia that used the PCCs were, at that time, temporarily converted. So to run out its, their required minimum useful life, a number of the cars went into special excursion service. Here's 2168 as the Chestnut Hill trolley with uh, you know, a motorman many people know, Gary Mason. Gary is still with SEPTA today. He still decorates the cars for the holidays. Uh, Harry captured Gary uh, on one of the weekend services in Chestnut Hill with our good friend yeah. 2168. Gary, Gary also was one of the favorite charter operators when we used to charter this car. And he's still on Route 10. He still does the Nightliner on Route 10. And then the car also was used on a service in Center City on 11th and 12th streets between Noble to the north and Bainbridge to the south called the Welcome Line. The Welcome Line. It was line. part of a program to promote Center City tourism. Um, there's arguably 2168's best friend, Harry, uh, seen on the opening weekend. There's Gary again on one of our charters. Yes, there's Gary. As Harry mentioned, this was a uh, 
50th birthday charter. It led to, this was one of the events that led to the founding of the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys. Harry and I thought it would be fun. We both liked the car. Um, <laughs> one of my children said, who is the young guy with Harry holding the sign? But um, time flies. But this was, it was a fun group. You know, a lot of these folks, unfortunately, aren't with us anymore. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. We had a great fan trip and it really helped start what ended up being what saved this car. We had a lot of fun on that fan trip. Um, we got in a little bit of trouble for blocking Market Street to get. Yeah, we had a photo, photo line across Market Street at 36. <laughs> but uh, they let us charter another car. Um, thankfully, we, we did get a little bit of heat for that. We made a great photo. We also posed it with an antique 49 Plymouth. Um, this was in a couple of magazines. Um, you'll see this photo again a little bit later. And as Harry mentions, very popular charter car. Uh, 2168, again, was one of the last of the cars in service in Philadelphia. Um, it was used for special events, as we mentioned, the welcome line around the holidays. Uh, this was after Chestnut Hill Trolley Service had ended, where the car was still available for, for special events and PR events and charters. It was used a number of times by a number of groups, including what was then the annual New Year's trip, uh, you can see here, this would have been 98 into 99. In fact, that's with his back to us is trip organizer, Ed Casey. Uh, Father Ed Casey did these trips and organized them for many years. Often they used 2168 in later years. Harry and I decided we had so much fun with other fan trips. We chartered three cars for a three generation trip back in 1999. Uh, we donated the proceeds. We split it among uh, Pennsylvania Trolley Museum and Rock Hill Trolley Museum at that time for different projects. Friends Philadelphia Trolley's was not incorporated, but we promised any proceeds we would make sure went back into cars. And Matt, and also, yeah. Matt, if I can jump in, one of the amazing things, remember Ed Springer said, Matt, you'll, <laughs> never, get, you'll never get enough people for three cars. And we somehow did it without the internet. Yeah. Because I didn't have a computer. I don't know if Matt did, but we didn't know much about the internet and we did it by, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> Sending we out letters, list. flyers. Oh yeah, we had mail mailing list. Mailing list. Everything was reserved by telephone. Yeah, uh, there was yeah. Social media, you know, as we know it today didn't exist. I remember the week before getting calls from people all over the country. I think we had around 130 people. Yeah. And that's when, we'll talk a little bit more about his influence, but the late Bob Hughes said, you know, you guys are on to something. I think you could start, you know, raising money to help at least keep car 2168 in Philadelphia. Little did we know things would change, but it ended up benefiting the car. He said, you're on to something. Let's try to do something with this momentum. Another fan trip with the car, just to show some of the variety of places. This is up on Route 10. Uh, amazingly enough, you know, you're looking at a scene completely free of graffiti back then. So as we mentioned, we decided a group of us, there were four of us, Harry, I, uh, Dave Harwitz, and Bill Monahan, later also joined by Roger Dupuy, tried to form, and did form successfully, a Pennsylvania nonprofit corporation to try and save the car. Our original intent was to be SEPTA's partner, to help raise funds so the car could always be on SEPTA's property and maintained for special events, charters, you know, community events, et cetera. So after we incorporate it, well, as I mentioned, we incorporate it. And Bob Hughes, you know, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, really helped us get this group started. He, he yeah. would talk to Harry and I after trips. We'd meet with him in his office at Elmwood Depot. He's like, you guys really got to do something. He gave us a lot of guidance early on. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, well, Bob's the one that really said, you guys need to incorporate and form a nonprofit. And uh, on our first charter, he gave, he gave the first $100 donation to FPT. He was, and he, he, Bob, Bob had stuff squirreled away all over Septa's property. Uh, MGs, uh, K control, KM controllers, <laughs> uh, door motors, and he helped all, he helped all the museums out. He was just great. He always helped the museums. Definitely. But unfortunately, he passed away about 10 years ago. Yeah, we'll always be grateful to Bob. He really gave us the push to get going with this. So what did we do after we incorporate? We raised more money. We did another charter. We chartered 2168. 
2168, you know, was popular. That's why a lot of it had a good fan following. One of the other things was, and, and sometimes it really helps, you know, it goes out saying to know people in the industry, um, the operators and others said, boy, if you want to save a car, 2168 is a really good car. It runs well. It looks bad, but it's really, if you're going to preserve a car, you know, it's really a good running car. You can see here by 2003, um, a, a year later, in fact, SEPTA pulled it, uh, didn't inspect the car and basically decommissioned it. Um, the car was starting to rot away pretty badly. There was a lot of rust up by the roof. The paint wasn't all that old, but well, it's 11 years old at that point. Well, really one, of, that, that, that one of the things was, unfortunately, from 1992 to 2004, either at Germantown <clears throat> or Elmwood, it was stored outside. And right. storing them outside it's just not good for them. And exactly. See, and it really you shows can see the roof line out. going there. But you know, the best laid plans. 2005 looked like it was about the end of the line finally. The car the car was saved from scrap once. And that was pretty amazing in itself. But in 2005, SEPTA made a decision at the leadership level is going to dispose of its quote historic fleet. Um, what they did was they sent letters to museum organizations on file. That itself was a bit of a convoluted process. I know at least one museum, the address was wrong <laughs> on getting a letter. Uh, they were starting at $200 a car for offers. And it was pretty clear the vehicles that were not taken by museums and removed by a certain date were planned to be dismantled. So this was really a unique circumstance. The Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys was new. We were about two years old. We had no track record. You know, we'd raised money successfully, chartered a non crop a nonprofit corporation legally successfully. But on our initial outreach to SEPTA, a few months before they got decided to um, cut costs, eliminate the historic fleet, they said, thank you. We really appreciate your interest, but we're not interested in a partnership. So we sort of became a group without mission, but some money in the bank. Um, Oddly enough, Baltimore Streetcar Museum was looking to acquire one, later two, uh, or more, SEPTA PCC cars with the concept of a car for general use. A party car was one of the thoughts. The other was just a car we could just clean up and run and save the wear and tear on some of the other cars in the fleet. Originally, they were going to pick a different car. Um, Harry and I found out the museum was, was going that route, and we said, well, would you be interested in partnering with us? We'd like you to save car 2168. We have money available. You have a need. You know, again, I, I can't give enough credit to Baltimore. We had a lot of ambition. We had a lot of goals. We didn't have a track record, but they were willing to take a chance with us. And the rest was history. We paid the $200 for the car. We paid the moving costs for Baltimore. And in June 2005, actually Father's Day, that Sunday, the car was loaded for the trip to Baltimore. Yeah, Matt, if I could jump in. The, guy in, the, the guy in the middle there with the green shirt, that's John Engelman. Uh, we were at an East Penn meet with a table, uh, FPT table, and John was next to us. John is longtime Baltimore streetcar member. And he just happened to say, well, we're going to get $21.99 and the museum's thinking of getting another one. And Matt and I looked at each other. We said, John, we got a deal for you. <laughs> so that, I mean, we were reaching the end of the rope because they had said the end of June, if the cars aren't gone, they're going. They're, we're getting rid of them. And we're now early June. And we didn't know where we were going to take the car. So it was thanks to John that we got. He went to the board and uh, told them, and the board said, okay, let's give them a chance. And thanks to John, uh, we got the car down there. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, Ed Amrine, many of you know, if you're involved in trolley museums, to the left of John called Harry. He had never talked to Harry before. and said, we want to take you up on this offer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing led to another. So this started the process to actually restore the car and bring it back to life. Here it is, the following Monday in Baltimore, uh, having just been delivered. Um, ironically enough, at the time, I worked in Baltimore about six blocks away, and so that'll be something interesting to do at lunchtime. Um, lots changed in the Baltimore Streetcar Museum since then. 
you know, you can see some of the track, which is uh, now part of its regular operations near near uh, track four in the car house didn't even exist. Track four or uh, bay four of the car house hadn't been completed yet. But here it is on delivery day, moving on to the temporary track. And that began the dilemma. The good news, we saved a tired old streetcar. Here's the bad news. At the same time, you saved a tired old streetcar. What do we plan to do? We made the decision, look, let's continue to raise money and let's play an active role. To borrow a line from a, my good friend, Bill Wall, many of you also involved in museums know him. You know, Bill has a saying, there's often three types of people, those who say what should be done, those who wonder how things get done, and those who make things happen. And although we were a new group, we were still learning, we said, you know, we wanted to do more than just say, here's your car, Baltimore, do something with it. We want to play a role. We want to be part of its restoration. We want to help you. We want to be part of bringing this car back to life. So we got started. I mean, early on, we did, uh, we did a lot of just simply cleaning up rust and temporarily priming it. We knew that wasn't a permanent solution. No, but Harry, for example, spent day after day just knocking rust down, putting in a primer to keep it under control until we could do more. Uh, the front of the car, you can see here, the, the blue, the orange, and the white was actually done with hardware store paint, just as a mock-up, just to give an idea. Uh, we'd come to the decision to try to restore the car in the Gulf of Oil colors, the orange. Uh, there were a lot of reasons for that. One of them was there weren't any others preserved that way. And it turned out to be a great educational tool, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, here it was on one of its first test trips. To get there, the car to be regaged. Uh, there's Ed again. Uh, the Baltimore Museum shop came up with a, a really novel way of regaging the car. You see they, they put basically a, a spacer between the back of what's called the wheel hub and the rubber, the resilient wheel sandwich. And they also made new spacer bolts that moved the wheels out just enough to Baltimore gauge and made the regaging feasible. The other thing we learned early on was that we really need to get and build a dedicated team. It, any restoration, I know Harry and I've talked restorations in another program, so we're not gonna go into great detail here, but you know, it really all comes down to the team, having a good group of people with the right motives, the right attitude and enthusiasm. And we also learn, you know, there's things we can do, but there's things we're going to need to hire help. And we're going to need to hire the right help, people who can get things done, you know, and in this case, knew something about car body restorations. We, in fact, got two guys who both had full-time jobs, but on nights and weekends did antique car work, and they just loved it. Unfortunately, they don't do this work anymore. Um, they did a couple of projects after this. Their own businesses took off enough that just became, <laughs> excuse me, became a challenge. But Mark and Paul, they did a fantastic job and they worked with us through our situations. You can see here they're doing some, the, the steel has been put onto the roof seam and repaired. Here they're doing some prep work. There's uh, Mark again, uh, painting the primer after the body work's been done up on the roof. It wasn't when, always consistent. Matt, Matt if yeah, I could yeah. jump in here. When we started this, we didn't have all the funding. We were just a few, steps ahead we were doing charters selling t-shirts anything we could do to raise money and we paid as we went uh for the body work these guys were really good to work with exactly yeah the progress followed the fundraising by the time now to date we've invested about fifty one thousand dollars in 20 well now it's fifty six thousand dollars but thanks to recent donations over the the four years of the restoration we were able to raise roughly $42,000, $44,000 to get the initial restoration done, including paying for the materials Baltimore needed to do the regaging, the bodywork, the painting. Um, you know, as Harry said, we worked really hard to raise the money from a variety of sources. A lot of fan trips, t-shirts. We did raffles of, of model trolleys, but it worked. Here's Mark. The priming is done. You know, we've raised money for the next phase of work, putting the orange on the car. And well, a hard life takes its toll. We said in Philadelphia, you know, it's not really a charmed life for a trolley car. Um, things like what's on the left, car 2168, 
actually pushing car 2743, which is now at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum, which was our second major project as an organization, as Friends Philadelphia Trolleys, 2168 pushed 2743 up on the ramp to be loaded. Um, pushing and towing, uh, absolutely in regular service, you know, it, it's done. It is really hard on a car, um, as any streetcar mechanic can tell you. Uh, it's an emergency feature, something not to be done unless absolutely necessary. Uh, on the right, uh, 2168 was used at least once to tow the El Paso car in Baltimore. And well, it's all fun and games until eventually you burn a hole in the accelerator. Um, thanks to Bob Hughes, we got another KM uh, commutator controller for the car. That's Bill Monahan and I taking the parts from two and making one good complete unit. Nothing like a deadline. The car body was done at this point. The paint, all new window glass, you know, the myriad of details went into it. Um, nothing like three weeks before the team of Ed Amrine, Matthew Mummer, John Lacoste, and I got the car running again. We put the replacement KM in, did some other electrical work, proved out the car, and it was ready to go. Uh, here it is shortly before it was its official dedication. And then September 12th, 2009, what a great day. Harry had the honor of running it out of the building for its ceremonial first trip. Um, seen here are the original four founding members of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, plus on the far left, Dave Nelson, one of our two uh, legal advisors. But a long way from 2005 and, uh, you know, and things looked really bleak. And it really was a great partnership. You know, Baltimore Street Car Museum took a chance with us. And it got us started. It led to a lot of good things, as we're going to talk about here in some of our remaining slides. But none of this would have happened without that partnership. Uh, we'll be forever grateful for that as an organization. Um, so Baltimore took a chance. We rose to the challenge, and the car was saved. That's only step one. But we should talk about what, what led to this. How did we succeed at this? And Harry and I thought long and hard about how to characterize this. One of the things was we worked really hard as, as an organization, as a Friends Philadelphia Trolleys, to build a good reputation. We really developed a partnership mentality. You know, Baltimore was willing to give us a shot, as we've mentioned. We tried to make it that, you know, this is not our way or the highway, or we know or what you should do. It was a true partnership. You know, we were willing to be cooperative. Our team, you know, we really tried to, to recruit people who brought different skill sets to the team. And we're willing to, to play ball with others. I, I'm a believer that, unfortunately, you know, if you have a team of people that every single person knows everything there is to need to know, um, it's hard to get anything done. We also committed to not just, hey, what should be done here on Tire Somebody, but doing some of the down and dirty hard work. We maintained our focus. We did give some other smaller grants during this time. The 2168 for four years remained the goal, the program, what we were trying to do. Uh, as Harry mentioned, we just methodically pushed forward. We had to raise money. Sometimes that was we need to raise money to prime. We need to raise money to put the base coat on. We need to raise money to finish the painting. Um, but we really, you know, it was a lot of fun. Again, we, we found that the enthusiasm was contagious. Uh, we had a great mix of people that just were enthusiasts, Baltimore Streetcar Museum members, some folks who work in a professional capacity in the transit industry. It really was a lot of fun. And you know, it was really a nice thing. Uh, John LaCosta from Baltimore Streetcar Museum made a comment as we were working on the car and somebody else, well, I really hope these guys stick around. And well, we have. And the success on this project gave the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys the confidence as well as the trustworthiness to pursue additional projects and support opportunities. And that's what, you know, the impact of Car 2168 is really about. It was a positive impact in Baltimore. You know, they got a car that you know, was rugged, reliable. As I mentioned, it, its primary purpose at first and still is to take some of the wear and tear off some of the other cars. Um, 7407, the last PCC car to run in Baltimore, the last street car to run in Baltimore's legacy system, you know, it helped takes the wear and tear off of that. That's, you know, it's pretty priceless when you have the last car to run in a certain city. Um, Baltimore's a number of cars from 1900 or earlier, which they do run in service. But every time 2168 is used for regular service, that's one less trip, that's less wear and tear. Some of those older cars and some of those, you know, irreplaceable cars aren't subject to. It's proven to be a car for all seasons. It's very popular at the winter events in Santa Claus, even in the snow. 
Uh, it's got good heat, carries a lot of people. You know, we're, again, you're not using something from 1900 and running it into the ground. And it's definitely popular for special events. The Friends Philadelphia Trolleys and Baltimore Streetcar Museum started what was called a 20, now a $25 day. Museums closed to the public. It's, you know, a, <coughs> excuse me, advanced guests only. Um, there's guest operation. 2168 has a real fan following among Philadelphia enthusiasts. Um, you can see here, the seven car lineup. Uh, Andrew Naughton took this photo for us. Cars from all generations. What's in front? 2168. But as a Paul, it, it really led to some positive impacts beyond just Baltimore. Since 2005, the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys have been able to provide more than $230,000 in preservation project grants to 10 different museums in support of at least 16 individual vehicles. But it all began with 2168 and a museum that was willing to give us a shot and take that risk. It led to other things. Our second project, as we mentioned, was the 2743 in Rock Hill Trolley Museum. You know, we did, we did some things to this. We went even beyond 2743. You know, we really went into the details for how the car would have looked from about 1959 to 1968. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see here, the car looks great. Um, Rock Hill doesn't run it very often, primarily special events, but you know, it is a really nice artifact in their collection. Um, 2168 runs all the time, but you know different operations, different different environment. But 2160 or 2743 is a, a very valuable part of the Rock Hill collection. We've also Matt, been able to do Matt, a number. Can I, Matt, can oh, I yeah. jump in here? Yeah, if you could Please. go back, go back to 2743. Uh, couple things we learned after 2168. Then we started on this car, and one of the things we've learned is. Okay, we concentrate on one car at a time. We can't, if we were working on 2743 fundraising, we can't take on another car till we're almost finished. We actually sent this car out to a place up in New Jersey. They did a great job. One of the things we learned too is, for instance, the standy windows. People like to, they will donate if you, you say a specific item. I got a price for standy windows with the rubber, uh, $25 a window. So we, who will donate a window? That went over real big. Uh, okay, we're going to do the interior. Uh, how about a seat? We, I got a great guy up here that does seats near my house. He gave me the prices. Uh, it cost about $7,500. We had the seats paid for in less than a year. Uh, just donate a seat, donate a seat. But we had other museums ask we could give a little bit, but we couldn't take it. We only took on one major project at a time. Otherwise, you get spread too thin. And these are some of the things we learned. And uh, this car, this car is a beautiful, he, they did a beautiful job on it. Definitely, definitely. It was just a lot of fun. It was and a lot sorry, of fun. I mean, we, we went. We went really into the details. We even chromed the marker lights, got the correct color lenses for that, that period, put a new headlight in it. Um, we, we made it as close as we could to it. Yeah, we, it, found it, out, we found out from Muni in San Francisco where to get the bigger headlights. And believe it or not, uh, they're from a, a car place in Nebraska. Uh, and they're, they're the same lights as in a 32 Ford Coupe. And that's what Muni uses now. It looks closer to the Golden Glow than the little sealed beam headlight Septa was using. Right. Although for, for 2168, it, the arrow we restored it, it had the smaller, the sealed beam lights, we went with it. But, you know, we've, it's led to a lot of other things and smaller projects. You know, this was one of multiple grants we provided to Pennsylvania Trial Museum. This was just basically for maintenance and upkeep on car 24. I guess we like cars in orange. Um, this was a really great project that, that we were able to take on after 2168. This is the C-145 sweeper. Uh, 2168 was there. This was the completion ceremony. Uh, we actually had the stenciling and the lettering done a few weeks later. Uh, it was a youth-led project. This was really a lot of fun. Who knows? Maybe the C-145 story will be a future trolleyology. Um, but again, it started, had we not succeeded with 2168, you know, that wouldn't have happened. And again... Again, 
who will who will buy a window for I got a price for the windows for the sweeper? Put it out there. Who will donate a window? One person donated all the windows, like three thirty five hundred dollars. Uh, they seem rather than to just say donate for the sweeper, they see people seem to like a specific. Wow, I want to put I want to get a window. Well, one guy donated all the windows on the sweeper. So these are just some fundraising things we found out over the years. You know, we've talked a lot about, okay, we're enthusiasts and we're museum members. We like streetcars. But 2168 also plays a unique educational role. And this has been a lesson learned. And hopefully, you know, something, you know, many museums realize this, we can, you know, we can all learn from. Every streetcar has a story to tell. It really depends how you tell it. But let's think, what vehicles often get saved? The first of a kind. The last or the last car to operate in a particular city. The one of a kind. You know, we can save those one, you know, those one-offs. It goes with the unique, a parlor car, a president's car. You know, if you think of rail, somebody years ago in Trains Magazine said, why is it we often save the president's, a railroad president's private car, we have so few ordinary coaches saved? Well, it begs the question, what did the average passenger ride? What did they ride to work? What did they ride to church to play? You know, where they just general errands around the city. And do we only preserve the industry in its heyday? We often, as preservationists, want to return something to how it looked, you know, it restored to original condition. But what about the times, particularly the 1970s, when the transit industry, there were real questions about whether or not it would survive? What would public transit look like? 2168 represents that. It was a car for the average person. You know, my son, Andrew, really helped me impart this on me. He said, you have something, you know, it's not the first, it's not the last. It's the everyday car. And sometimes that's overlooked. You know, riding to work, you know, even for a trolley fan, not every day is glamorous, glorious. It can be gloomy. You got to transfer to a different mode of transportation. You know, the cars aren't pristine like in a museum. 2168 represents that time in the transit industry, really an underrepresented time. You can see here, I mean, 1970s, tired streetcars, tired infrastructure. Um, Restored to orange, now 2168 certainly doesn't look tired anymore, but it helps preserve an era that's largely unnoticed and unrecognized. But it's preserved to serve that educational value. At the end of the day, museums are educational nonprofit corporations. So finally, sustainment. It's one thing to save a car, like we've talked about. It's one thing to restore a car. We need to interpret our cars you know, from an educational point. But what about keeping them going? It just doesn't end with restoration. It only goes so far. And that's one of the things we've been happy to do through the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, as well as many of us are also, and, and have become Baltimore members. Um, you know, restoration only goes so far. The car is used a lot in Baltimore. It runs practically all the time. Things wear out. We've changed motor generator. That has worn out. Uh, we got a very, we were very fortunate. First, we got a loaner MG. Uh, again, courtesy of Bill Wall, then we had the other MG rebuilt, completely rewound and installed it. You know, just little upkeep and maintenance. Logan Tracy, a uh, very active youth member in Baltimore, you know, spent a lot of time making sure 2168 remains in good shape, continues to look good. And we've committed to the future. Um, this was one of our $20 days in the past. This was right before COVID, actually. We had a great crowd. You know, Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys was really happy to provide Baltimore Streetcar Museum at that time with another $9,000 grant to help for some upkeep work on 2168, you know, general maintenance and upkeep. Um, it was a down payment on some new or it was funds to match a grant for some new doors, which we put in this fall. Um, on the stairs with his back sort of to us in the greens, Jerry Satterelli. Jerry's a master carpenter. He's done work for Baltimore. He's doing some work for National Capital. Jerry is just a wonderful craftsman. Jerry also has often donated his field labor to the museums, uh, which is a huge gift to us. Uh, Jerry's great. He's a guy who Matt, gets things. Matt? Like yeah, Harry. Don't forget, Jerry Jerry made all the new slats for the sweeper, too. And the windows and the window, and the window frames. The all the repairs. window frames for the sweeper. He's, yeah, Jerry he's is amazing. Been, He's a friend. He's also, you know, a contractor. A lot of museums. 
the doors, the, these doors dated from the early 1970s. We found that they were just simply falling apart. Yeah, they um, were the original uh, original banana car doors. In fact, we stripped them down, you could see remnants of it. Um, yeah, the yellow was still under there. <laughs> Jerry had made, made new ones out of ring grade plywood and put real glass back in them. Um, this fall, we got the new doors in. The repainting of the doors will be part of the next project, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but the doors are in. The door controls need some work. There's Matthew Mummert again on the left. Uh, Matthew's also an engineer in the transit industry, works full time. On the right's Robert King from Canada. Robert has done a lot, provided a lot of help on this car, as well as the Newark car in Baltimore. This was one of those rare times during COVID, the border was back open. Robert was able to come down for a week and help us out. Um, but it shows that ongoing commitment to ensuring this car is around for the future. Next, preventative repairs. You know, wear and tear takes a toll on a car. There are some areas of the floor line, uh, you know, the rust has come back. As Harry mentioned, the years of sitting outside before the car was restored and then just hard service life in Philadelphia. Um, this is the next project we're working on for the car. You know, it really never ends. It's preventive maintenance never ends. So our flyer is here. Uh, we can put the link in the chat. There's a YouTube video, which Logan Tracy made uh, of Harry and I explaining this project and what needs to be done, how people can contribute to it. Um, again, I can put the link in the chat when we're done or as a follow-up, uh, or you can just Google Logan Tracy uh, car 2168 and you'll find a, a great video. Harry and I narrate about what the future is for the car. And why do we do this? You know, why do we save these cars? Why do we educate them? Really, it's for the next generation. We need the youth. That's our future as organizations. Again, we've been very lucky in Baltimore. Baltimore has been very successful with recruiting younger members. Um, you can see here, this group, in fact, really likes 2168. We're very lucky. Um, you know, it's one of the, the, these four folks are only four out of seven members who are under the age of 30 that are very active at the museum. You know, but that's our legacy. We want to leave some of these folks. They, you know, a lot went into this card as great educational value. But why are we doing it if we're not able to pass this on to the next generation? As I mentioned, if you remember that photo from 1998, here's July 5th, 2018, same 1949 Plymouth. Same 2168, both looking even better, still with us today. For more information about the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, just very easy, all one word, friendsofphiladelphiatrolleys.org. And that's it. Really appreciate everybody's patience while we got started and uh, your interest this evening. Thank you, Matt and Harry. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad we all waited around because uh, that was certainly worth it. Um, we'll do questions and answers. Um, I'll give you guys a moment to look through the very active chat uh, during this presentation. So feel free to turn on your videos, everybody now. If you can't do that, um, I can come along and, um, and, and let you do that. But um, before we get to questions, I just wanna let everybody know once more that we do have another trolleyology next week about um, Shaker Heights Rapid Transit, the PCC era presented by Bram Bailey with Rich Krusak. And um, you can sign up for that now. All the proceeds for that will go to um, the Car 90, uh, Shaker Heights Car 94 fund. Um, once again, save the date. April 1st, we reopen June 3rd and 4th, Western Pennsylvania Trolley Meet, the first one in person since 2018, uh, which also lines up with anything on wheels. Um, thanks again for coming, especially thank you to those of you who made a donation during the registration process tonight. We, we truly appreciate that. You can go to patrolley.org slash support, which I put in the chat box a moment ago. And uh, Matt, if you haven't already, feel free to drop the link to uh, Friends of Philly Trolleys in there um, and any other, uh, your, you, the Logan YouTube video or anything you'd want to put in there. Um, I'm going to let everybody unmute themselves in just a moment here, but you guys can go ahead and um, answer any of the questions. I think a lot of the questions in the chat were actually answered um, by other uh, viewers. So thank you guys <laughs> for doing all that. Yeah, thank you. I was trying to keep up. I apologize. There's others, you know, certainly I'll try to stick around and put the links in um, like we talked about. And again, I, I Harry and I are really grateful for people uh, 
sticking around. I we did a dry run. We test everything. We tested computer earlier, and it just decided it was going to have a moment this evening. So. <laughs> And uh, for anybody watching this back on YouTube afterwards, if you're wondering what we're talking about, we got started about an hour late today, but um, all's good now. We did the presentation and we had about 60 people um, to start with. We were down to 45 now. And uh, if anyone has questions, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Great job on the presentation overall, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I want to add one thing to what you brought to the next generation. Um, I mean, you certainly introduced me, me to running PCC cars. Um, the museum I've been primarily with, PCC is really, there, there was a culture of they're only for the highly experienced people. Uh, I went down to Baltimore just to visit one day. Actually, it was one of the $20 days. So once again, your work, you, know, you, you guys made that happen. And Harry, who I had really only just met, was like, you got to learn to run the PCC. Like, um, you sure? You have to be really experienced to do that. No, you don't. Oh, let me show you. <laughs> and been a PCC lover ever since. And I uh, took a young lady with me down to a much many years later, uh, $20 day. Harry showed her how to run the PCC car, even though she does not drive. She does not get along with automobiles, any other vehicle like that at all. She learned to run a PCC car. And, well, I must not have scared her off too badly because I married her some years after that. <laughs> well, yeah, so. Harry is our PCC trainer. Um, all three of my children have run Car 2168. I think Harry was the, uh, the instructor for them. Uh, I guess the seat is safe now. Um, Oddly enough, the first trolley I ever, first PCC car, excuse me, I ever operated um, back in some of those photos when I had hair was uh, courtesy of Bob Hughes uh, as well. But Kristen, I don't know if you had earlier in the show uh, while we were waiting, if you told your connection to 2168. I thought that was really interesting. Hey, Matt. I did. Oh, okay. Did I, yeah, I did. I mentioned um, the first streetcar museum I ever went to was Baltimore Streetcar Museum. And uh, the very first PCC I ever rode was 2168. <laughs> wow. Hey, yeah, Matt, ever, yeah, Harry. Uh, I guess we can let out the secret on New Year's Eve around 2001 when Ed Springer <laughs> said, in the subway, one o'clock in the morning, New Year's Eve, there were no cameras on the car, no cameras <laughs> in the stations. So we got to run 2168 of the subway. On a new year's <laughs> trip, yeah, um, yeah, a bunch of us took turns. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite told my employer that one yet. We'll we'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could get in trouble now. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. Everybody involved is retired, and there are no cameras and photos of that. <laughs> Different time in public transit, let's just say. But. Um, Hey, uh, uh, this is Hugh out in Los Angeles. Just want to say marvelous presentation. Love the quality of the photographs and the, uh, the, the personal stories behind them as well. Um, Harry, I heard you from time to time mentioning identifying people. I hope that that's documented on the presentation somewhere or that you can do that. If you're using PowerPoint, below each slide, there's a place for notes. If you could put the person's name and little little biography of them or something for posterity. That's a good point, Hugh. Yeah, no, I agree. The notes, I, yeah. We've, we've noted in the photos in our files, but um, I think it's a really good point is like, you know, Bob Hughes is not with us. Some of the folks that came on the 50th birthday trip, uh, a lot of them aren't here, unfortunately. Yeah, and yeah I, I take your point to heart. I think that's really important. So it wasn't it wasn't difficult for me to stay up because it's only six twenty p.m. <laughs> here. Out there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How deep is your snow? <laughs> snow? What snow? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was well, eighty degrees here today. It was actually fifty two, and and a lot of mine melted. Although I spent the afternoon chipping away at all the ice that had come first. 
Hey, uh, Kristen, please give my regards to Larry Lovejoy. I've worked with Larry in the past, and he's your, I think he's still your chief engineer there, isn't he? Sure is. Yeah, he's working hard on everything involved with our new building, um, which we're expecting to open in early 2023. Right. Awesome. Uh, my uh, my partner who accompanied me on the Baltimore Streetcar Museum trip uh, said afterwards, your life will now be divided into before PCC and after PCC. And what do you know? Now I work at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. So <laughs> it's true. Uh, any other questions for Harry or Matt? Just a quick question. The PCC twos on uh, from Gerard Avenue. Uh, are they going? When do you think that they'll be uh, put back on Gerard? I have not heard a time frame yet, Alan. On that, I mean, SEPTA has completed some track work. Actually, it was back in January. Um, they did ran some test cars all the way up to uh, Cumberland Street. Um, I believe there's still some bridge work which isn't done. Um, as I recall, the track was in. I was there that day actually, and they towed the cars across that section the wire was down uh, the cars themselves are being done one at a time i want to say harry you may remember is it up the, the the fourth car is about done now i believe yeah the fourth car is about to come out of the shop they're letting them sit down at elwood instead of running them we tried to charter one and it was all set up and then the very higher up said no 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 you can't take it out i mean they ought to be running them to check check out any bugs but well, what are you going to do? They, they, yeah. they, they yeah. know best. That, that was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was Leslie Richards, who's their executive yes. director. Yeah. Or PennDOT uh, uh, operations yeah. director. So we don't know if they're going to do, uh, wait till they're done and have a big, you know, political wah um, mm -hmm. and a photo thing. But remember that, that they got burned before on this because when they brought – the PCCs over to Callow Hill, you know, after being redone at Brookville, they hadn't ever run them really. And, right. and uh, they found all sorts of bugs and, and also had an issue with the neighborhood who, who had begun parking bad, badly. Um, yeah. Now San Francisco, right. San Francisco Muni, when they get a car back from Brookville, it has to do a thousand mile burning with no problems before they accept it. So they, they get all the bugs out of them, but SEPTA is just letting them sit. And I, I yeah. can't One figure out. One thing I will give them credit for, though, and, and Harry was with me, we got a uh, an opportunity to get to actually, as you say, interview the uh, the craftsmen doing the work at Woodland and got to learn some of the redesign. In fact, I have to give them credit for the work being done. They're doing stuff. a beautiful they're job. Doing they're doing but a beautiful job. Really, yeah, and it's not just skin deep. I mean, they actually have cut the sides off the cars. They've done a structural redesign um, that wasn't present in the original workfield job. That's not Brookfield's fault. It wasn't part of the original specs. But they've actually done a redesign that stiffens the lower sides. Um, some cases they've rewired entirely a couple cars. Other cars, you know, they've removed the wiring harness, put it back in depending upon condition. Um, but it's remarkable. This is... Uh, it's taking a while, but the job they're doing on the cars is definitely not, you know, a cleanup and patch job. Unfortunately, no, it's, it's just it, it's, it's first class. It's first class. You would think. One, question, one more question, if you will. There's sure. two endpoints on the eastern end, the casino and the old one. Right. Uh, are they going to restore service to both or just one or what? What I understand is both. I want to say the Sugar House Loop, which uh, the, by the casino is going to be kept as a short term. Um, the track work, which they didn't receive funding for. So as part of useful life requirements, they have to use it. Um, all the way to Cumberland Street, you know, will have service at some point. It's part of, again, the federal funding. You get the funding. You do have to maintain useful life. Um, it is watched. <laughs> Trust yeah. me on that. I have some inside knowledge as to why that's watched. Um, Unfortunately, they do not have enough cars, even without using the Sugar House loop. 18 cars is not enough for rush hour service, so there will always be buses out there. Uh, they had an option for 26 cars 15 years ago, and the management accepted at the time said, no, 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 we don't need them. And 
unfortunately, they need about six or eight more cars to really, because you always have a car in the shop for inspection, whatever. So there will always be buses out there, unfortunately. Right. And there's a comment in the chat. It's a 10-year requirement. It's actually 15. Uh, the federal, the FDA funding requirements for what constitutes an overhaul is a 15-year service life extension. So now when the cars enter service, you know, or at least start to turn revenue mileage, uh, that clock will start. You would think you would yeah. think they would move the cars to Cal Hill and get them under roof. Get them under the roof. That's common sense. <laughs> uh, common sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If they're going to sit, if they're going to sit that long, it, it's kind of it's a shame. Why, why leave them outside? Because they're outside in Elmwood. Right. Question: uh, When do they expect to order and get delivered? <laughs> no idea. Interesting. And of course, they just they just lost the location they were picking for a new car house. Now yeah. yep. you're back to side one, and they really, you know, there's very little, you know, proper space for a car house. Uh, and Amazon grabbed the uh, the site they wanted. That would have been perfect. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you don't want to go farther down on Island Avenue. That's a floodplain. Yep. The, the uh, idea with the idea with the uh, GLGE plant would have gave them access to the railroad for the commuter cars and the trolleys. Yep. Right. Yeah. One thing a little diverged I do want to mention, Kristen reminded me, um, for those who are active members of uh, trolley museums here on the East Coast, you may be familiar with the Winterfest that's usually held at a host museum. Uh, each museum, you know, determines from their active members, you know, who they invite, but generally their active participants receive an invitation. This year is going to be virtual. In fact, if you like the presentation tonight, uh, there will be a slate of similar presentations coming up on February 26th. Um, the Winterfest, as I mentioned, will be virtual and each participating museum is putting together a presentation. If the schedule permits, uh, we're probably gonna have a condensed version of this one on 2168 as well. Not this full version, but a shorter one. Um, but uh, again, if you're an active participant at one or more uh, trolley museums, you should, if you haven't heard already, you should be looking forward to a, uh, some more from your museum leadership about that event. Um, I'll be one of the co-hosts along with uh, my son, Andrew. And um, again, if you like this type of presentation, there'll be a great opportunity to, to spend an entire day um, hearing more of them. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I know uh, the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum is looking forward to participating and uh, quite a few other museums as well. So thank you, Matt, for yeah. putting that together and managing all the scheduling and museums. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, before we wrap up, do we have any other questions about tonight's program? I hate to keep on asking questions, but if you don't okay. mind. Sure. Okay. How long can the subway uh, surface cars last, the Kawasaki's. I mean, they're what, uh, 40 years old already? 40 years old, yep. 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 How long does, does Philadelphia expect them to, to last? Or are they just going to wait until they fall apart so that they can scrap the whole system? I'm paranoid. They're going to be here a while yet. Let's, and I, I say that, you know, if you look at the, the lead time for a rail car procurement, um, you're, you're talking... If they, and they're not ready, as I understand, they're not ready. If you had a package together to solicit for a contract and you could award it tomorrow, which also takes, you know, anywhere, let's just say six months on average, you're talking three years in a rush, five years before you have cars even delivered. Um, you're also talking about Philadelphia having a very unique requirement. You know, if, if they went car for car, not saying they will, you need 112 single end and 29 double end cars. And Philadelphia's clearances are somewhat unique. You know, the, the, the curve radius, the width of the cars. If you look at, you know, comparable rail cars in the market today, uh, anything would need modifications of some kind to work in Philadelphia. So long story short, Alan, I, if it was five years, I'd be shocked. I think more like 10. Um, no, no, I'm not asking about the delay. I understand everything you said. Uh, what the question is, is what kind of shape are the cars existing fleet in and does Philadelphia expect it to last for another 10 years? Uh, they are in pretty good shape. They, the maintenance on them is good. Uh, everyone, none of them have been scrapped. 
Uh, there, there are one, there's one or two in the shop uh, that have been delayed because of the PCC2 project, but every one of them is still on the roster. And uh, they were really well designed. I mean, they, they were designed specifically for Philadelphia and uh, they were designed in-house. They didn't go to some outside consultant. And uh, I think they can get 10 more years out of them. Uh, we had already a few years ago, FPT, we had already approached SEPTA because we want to get we want to get nine thousand out at PTM when it retires, and we thought by twenty twenty three or four we'd have it out there, but I guess it's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I take it you guys heard about the little accident in Darby a couple of months ago with ninety seventy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, yeah. With the train they, yeah. When when inquired, they didn't even think twice about repairing it. They're definitely going to do so. Oh yeah, because they consider any body work to be done now with Kawasaki's are going to last at least 10 more years, at least 10 more years. Okay. And all the PCC twos, they told me they won't all be finished till 2026 because route 15 won't be ready to run till then. So they're going to upgrade all, they're supposed to upgrade all the lines in the system for light rail standards for the future fleet, which they don't even have on the table yet. And the market Frankfurts are getting really bad, so they have to go first. That's going to delay the light rail acquisition even further. Okay. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, to buy new cars for subway surface, of yeah, course. Just, just, for, just for a working date, the best I could come for delivery was 2035 for new cars. Right. So there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, per federal requirements, if they buy, purchase new equipment, they have to make the line fully compliant with yeah, ADA. There's no, there's no rush in any, in, any, in any hand. There's no rush. There's too much other stuff going on in front, so it won't be anytime soon. Okay? Mm -hmm. See what happens. Well, yep. and like, let's see, in like 20, 25 years, someone will be doing a, a presentation about how this K car got saved and <laughs> <laughs> photos of it everywhere. <laughs> how, we, how we saved 9,000. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. another first. Yep. <laughs> Better save right. another one, so it's the every car. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, All right. They've had cars banged up worse than the one with the had the train incident in Darby. Oh yeah. yeah. Bad in comparison. Has, has anybody heard any rumors as to how in the heck uh, the picture showed that the crossing gate was on top of the car, but the car would have had to been forward of that to be dinged by the train. I have to abstain from that conversation, Sartine. <laughs> that one I, I can't comment on. Well, I think that is a good place to uh, wrap up tonight. Um, and uh, I want to thank Harry and Matt again for coming out to present tonight. And I want to thank everybody who stuck around tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you missed any of tonight's presentation, we will be putting it on YouTube and hopefully we'll have Matt and Harry back again for something else in the future, maybe the sweeper car. Um, okay. Thank you again. And especially thank you to those who donated. And we'll see you again next week for the Shaker Heights PCC era presentation. Okay. Well All done. Right. Thank you. Good night, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.